Hello everyone, in this video we are going to talk about finite element procedure. In finite element software such as ANSYS, you can create the geometry, measure, part, and get the solution. But to know whether that solution is accurate or not, how you can improve the solution, what are the source of uncertainty in your analysis, you need to know what's happening behind the scene. You need to know the finite element uh, formulation. And that's what we are going to talk about uh, in the lecture component of uh, this course. So you get some insight uh, from the procedure and know how to judge your result and how to improve your result. Use three methods for finite element. The first one is direct approach where we use it where we can directly find the stiffness uh, matrix for our model is applicable for simple geometry such as bar trusses. Uh, the second approach is variational methods that we use to minimize the strain energy to get the stiffness matrix. And the third approach is weighted residual approach where we uh, develop our finite element formulation by only uh, working with governing the governing equation. So first we are going to talk about the direct approach. The first step is to discretize your continuum, to change your continuous model into simpler geometries. And that's where the name finite element comes from. We are changing a continuous model into a finite number of elements. So in this case, I'm sh I have converted my uh, bar model into a bar with four elements and you can see we introduce some errors by doing that because the, our elements is no longer continuous and they have different uh, cross-sectional area. So in this model I have four elements and five nodes. The nodes are connecting the elements together. We find the displacement and forces at nodes and, uh, and then we use the element formulation to find the stresses and the stress uh, across the nodes. Uh, one important feature of uh, discretizing our continuum is to know how many number of elements uh, we need. As we increase the number of elements, instead of having four elements, if I use ten elements, of course my error is going to be decreased. I'm going to have higher accuracy. But it comes at a price, and that would be our computational cost. The higher number of elements would introduce us, would return higher accuracy, but at the same time increases the computational cost. So it's very important to use adequate number of elements. One way to determine that would be to uh, use mesh sensitivity analysis. If you're interested in finding the displacement at node 5, you could find that for uh, by modeling 5 elements, 10 elements, 100 elements, and if you see you're reaching a convergence, that means that you have reached the correct number of elements. Otherwise, you really can't judge your FEA solution because as you increase or decrease your number of elements, your result is going to be different. So you need to reach convergence. Otherwise, your result is not reliable. That's FEA 101. The second step is to determine your element stiffness. And uh, for a simple case of bar, we can convert that into a spring or an equivalent spring. And to find that stiffness for our spring, we can use the Hooke's law. In Hooke's law, we know that the stresses are related to the strains using the Hooke's law, where E is the elastic modulus, is the material property. For the case of uniaxial tension or uniaxial loading, the stress is simply F over A, and the strain is delta L over L. If I rearrange the equation, I find F is EA over L delta L. And if I compare it with the spring equation, which F is K delta L, I know that the, my equivalent stiffness is E times A over L, where E is elastic modulus, A is a cross section, and L would be the original length. So if I break this model into different elements, if the material is the same, E would be the same, but the cross-section would be different, or the length would be different. If you have the same uh, equally, uh, equal distance uh, elements, then L would be the same as well. The third uh, 
step would to assemble our system of equation. So we develop stiffness metrics for each element, but we need to have a global stiffness metrics representing the whole system. So let's say for this example, I have three elements. I have element one here, let's call this element two and element three. And after finding the stiffness metric for each element, I need to combine all of them into a global matrix and that, rep that will represent the whole system. And we assemble our system of equation using the nodes. I know that the node tr 3 here is connecting these two members, node 2 is connecting these two members, and I will develop my uh, system of equations. Uh, the next step is to impose boundary conditions. Again, for in this example, at node 1, there is no displacement in x direction and there is no displacement in y direction. At node 2, we have, it's free to move in x direction, but it's confined in y direction. Whenever we have a displacement boundary condition, whenever, whenever we have a set value for a displacement, there is going to be a corresponding reaction force. And this one doesn't have to be zero. We could say that the displacement at one node one in x direction should be 10 millimeter. When we specify a value, then we are going to have a reaction force. So what, whenever the displacement is known, the reaction force is unknown. And same thing as here. And the last step is to get our solution. But well, we are going to divide our solution into two different solution categories. We are going to call them primary and secondary. Well, a primary solution would be the nodal displacement. And the secondary would be a strains and a stresses. The primary solution would be more accurate because that's what we directly get from finite element. So if you can see that I, I would just multiply every side by the inverse of a stiffness matrix and we got u is equal to inverse of k times f. So that's the primary solution. That's what we get directly. And then after that, if I take derivative of the displacement that I found, I would get strains. If I multiply it by the elasticity tensor, I would get stresses but they are not as accurate. So you need more number of elements to get accurate results for the secondary solution. To better show you why primary solution is easier to achieve, we can look at this example. Here I'm showing you the displacement as function of the length of scale, as function of the length of our beam element. So the solid line is the accurate solution, is the exact solution, and the dashed line is FVA. You can see if we divide our model into five elements, the displacement can be reasonably predicted. You can see there is not much difference between the two. And here is LE represents element length is 0.2, means 20% of the total. We have five elements. And um, you, you see some errors, but with five elements, it's, it's, it's not really bad. If you look at this plot, which is a strain, you can see the dashed line and the exact solution. There is a huge error. First of all, the, are not, the strain is not continuous. And in some region, it's better than some other regions, but there is a significant error. And simply because the strain, you're taking a derivative of the displacement. Here, if in FEA, if each element you're using a linear model, if your displacement is linear, therefore the slope of a linear line is a constant value. And that's why you get this constant value. If you increase the number of elements here, you get a better answer. Instead of having five elements, if you have 10 elements, so LE, the element length would be 0.1 or 10%. You see that in these areas you get much better result. Here at the very beginning, still we don't we don't have as uh, we don't have an accurate uh, solution. So and then the stresses would be similar. You just need to multiply the strains by the constant value of elasticity tensor. That's why the primary solution is more accurate than the secondary solution. You need more number of elements to satisfy. Uh, the secondary solution. So that's one thing that you uh, you need to pay attention to in your in your analysis. For elements, we need to define some uh, terminology. We deal with element shape, which could be one dimensional, two dimensional, or three dimensional. Each element, whether they are one D, two D, or three D, could be linear, quadratic, cubic, or or even higher order. 
the type of known variable determine what kind of analysis you're going to have, whether you're going to have static analysis or thermal, electrical, or uh, fluid analysis. Then the element could have different interpolation function. You could have polynomial, which is the most simple and straightforward, uh, and is mostly used, or trigonometric. And the method of integration, we are going to use numerical integration to solve our stiffness matrices. You can use full integration or simplify it to reduce integration. That's one of the last topics that, that we talk in this class. The element shape. So spring, dampers, bar, rod, truss, beam, frames can be represented by a 1D element. The element name in ANSYS is link, beam, and pipe, and there is usually a number associated with that, like link 2, link 180, and each element is going to have a, its own feature. They could be either first order, which means that there are only two nodes, or they could be higher order or quadratic, or three uh, noded. Uh, so you need to remember our definition of 1D, it means that the variable, the nodal variable, that could be displacement, temperature, uh, voltage, only depends on one dimension. So we could have multiple degrees of freedom. So let's say for a beam element, we could have UX, UY, we could have the angle, we could have three degrees of freedom, but each of them is going to depend only in one dimension. And that's the definition of uh, 1D element. So our element is 1D but our element could be in a 3D space. For 2D elements, you can have shell element, plane stress, plane strain, axis symmetric. In reality, everything is 3D. So whenever we talk about 2D, which means that we are talking, we are having an assumption. And whenever you use the word 2D, you need to make sure that you're expressing what kind of assumption you're having. Are you assuming a 2D strain or 2D stresses or your model is axisymmetric. So just saying that I use a 2D model is not sufficient. You need to determine what category is it. Uh, the element name, we can have triangular or quadrilateral as the name suggests, or either three-sided, four-sided. Similar to 1D elements, we could have linear or quadratic. As you increase the number of uh, nodes per element, your model gets more accurate, but your computational cost gets higher. There are six noded and eight noded. There are some elements that have interior nodes. The interior nodes are the nodes that are not shared by any other elements. And uh, nowadays, most software are eliminating those um, elements with interior nodes. But we'll discuss them. That's the difference between Lagrangian and serendipity elements. In the case of 3D, we have tetrahedrons, which are four faces. So for 2D, remember we use quadrilateral. Quad and tetra both means four, but for 3D we use tetrahedrons. For 2D we use quadrilateral. The name is very important because that's how we communicate. That's how you communicate in your report, in your presentation, in other lectures. So I want you to really learn the names of the elements. So when you're talking about tetrahedrons or pentahedrons, uh, you know what you're talking about. Similarly, it could be first order or second order. When it gets to uh, pentahedrons, you have the option of prism or permits, and uh, the geometries are self-explanatory. You could have higher order. So I'm just showing you first order or second order. You could have like higher order as well. And hexahedrons. Hexahedron is uh, usually the most accurate one. So if, you, uh, if for most models, you have to use hexahedron to get a reliable response. But the challenge with hexahedron is that it's not easy to mesh. So if you have a complex geometry that has fillets and a hole and different bunch of uh, cutouts, uh, sometimes the software cannot really use the hexahedron. In ANSYS, the default is tetrahedrons. And that's because it's the simplest one because it's, it can mesh any geometry. It doesn't mean it's the best. So in general, hexahedron is the best, but it's difficult to mesh. And the meshing is uh, different software use different algorithms. Uh, so if you can't really mesh it, then you could, you could I guess, go and use tetrahedrons in, in your model. And of course, the second order are more accurate than the first order. 
but they have higher computational cost and it's a really a judgment call and depends on the application whether it's better to use more number of linear elements or fewer number of quadratic elements so instead of using let's say one or 100 uh, quadratic hexahedrons if you use like half of that or if you use double of that but use the linear elements uh, in some application one would be a better than better approach than the other we also have higher order elements as I mentioned we have cubic elements or curved elements but uh, we try not to use the complex elements if if you need more accuracy it's better to use more number of elements than using uh, more complex element in APDL the good thing about it is that it lets you choose the element type you have to choose the element type to proceed but in workbench that now that most people are using workbench the type of element is automatically selected which is good you don't need to know which element type to use but at the same time it's a quick and dirty way of uh, choosing an element it just chooses the, the simplest one but you can override that comment you could uh, use the com go to the comment go to type this et element type material id mat id and then choose your element name so it if if it can mesh it with that element type uh, it will and then it will change your uh, element type to the one that you you're 